good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Welcome to the Wild and Precious Optimal Living Show. I am your host, Dr. Sam. And I am Dr. Lynn. And we are so glad for you to join us today after our little hiatus. Grateful to be back, grateful to be back on the air, and grateful to be talking about all the wonderful content and information that we have. So health happens by choice, not by chance. You have this one wildly intelligent and precious body that dictates the quality of your life. On this show, we have candid conversations about alternative options for families. And as always, our show is sponsored by NeuroSolutions Lasers. So if you're new to the show and have not heard about this, laser therapy is the healthcare of the future. And as with any tool, it's only as effective as the person that uses it. And that's what really sets NeuroSolutions apart from every other company out there, is that they provide you with the training, with the background and the information to help the tool be most effective as possible. So if you're looking to up your healthcare game, whether you're a healthcare practitioner or you're you know, just a family looking for something to add to keep you guys healthy through the holiday season, I can't recommend anything better than a NeuroSolutions laser. So. Dr. Lynn, today we're going to talk about something that is incredibly common, but really not totally understood in not just the healthcare world, but in people's personal healthcare journey, and that is migraines and headaches. Uh, everyone has probably had a headache at some point in their life, and we're going to talk about what causes headaches. We're going to, if you struggle with migraines, we're going to ask the question, why? And we're going to get some answers as to why people struggle with those. We're going to answer these questions and we're going to talk about a lot more with our guest today and our longtime friend, Dr. Joe Adams. So Dr. Joe has a passion for helping people with significant health challenges through integrated care that includes chiropractic, functional neurology, vestibular rehabilitation, neuro-ophthalmology, and physical therapy. He loves helping people who are suffering from migraines find healing. He filled his internship at an integrated neurological rehabilitation center where he focused on providing care to some of the most challenging cases. He earned his master's degree in clinical neuroscience in 2020 and recently was named Parker University's Young Alumni of the Year in 2021. He owns and practices with his wife at Calibration Chiropractic in Mansfield, Texas. Dr. Joe, welcome to the show. Welcome. Hey, thanks for having me on. I'm really excited about this opportunity and I always have a good time hanging out with uh, the two of you guys. So I'm, I'm excited to be here. Absolutely. So yeah, fun fact for our audience out there, Dr. Joe, actually, we all went to school together and he was just a class behind us at Parker. So we've known, known this guy for a long time, been long time friends with him and his lovely wife, Jordan. And yeah, just super happy to have you on, sir. It's, uh, it's going to be fun. So Joe, um, if you could, just, just get started so our audience can know you a little bit better. Just share your story, how you got into chiropractic, what led you down this path now, focusing and becoming an expert on headaches and migraines. Um, just share about that. Wow. Um, yeah, I didn't plan on winding up taking care of people with migraines or, or headaches or even neurological conditions originally. I, like many people who have utilized chiropractic, utilized it mostly originally, personally, before becoming uh, a chiropractor as a, as a patient. And most of that was from getting injured, you know, working out and being very physically active. And, you know, I was really big across it for a while and got, you know, injured a lot. I was going to chiropractor and it helped me a lot. And I, and I spent a lot of time before becoming a chiropractor working with my hands. And so one day I was like, you know what, it'd be really fun to you know, take care of people with my hands and it seems like chiropractic is a really good fit for that. So with the chiropractic school and thought maybe I would do sports chiropractic or, you know, like family chiropractic and wound up uh, on the other end of that spectrum. Uh, and I think it really, for me, it, it was because I was really curious about how we can help people who had some serious problems going on. And I, I stumbled on to a group of doctors that had a unique skill set where they were using more than you know, just chiropractic to get people better. They were pulling from neurology and nutrition and all, all these other different fields. And it was really intriguing to me. And some of these patients were just really in, in bad shape and 
well, you know, once you have one of those people, you you get addicted to it, right? It's just like, man, this is so much fun giving people their lives back. And that's really what my journey has been, is starting out just thinking, hey, I'm going to help some weekend warriors like myself all the way up to now. It's like, oh, wow, you have, you know, 15 migraines, uh, you know, episodes a month. You know, can we, can we get that down, you know? Can we help you get a better quality of life? And that's really what we're going now. That's awesome. Yeah, that's sounds, and this is part of the reason why we had Dr. Joe come on. His his journey's been fairly similar to ours, where you know we both had the similar you know experience and similar thought process of oh we're going to open up this cute little family office and this family practice. We're just going to jam out with athletes and stuff like that, and maybe throw some yoga in there with it. And it's really transformed into yeah this more of. Um, integrated office with you know this heavy neurology focus and these other pieces in there yeah and I think the big thing for our listeners to tune into I mean when we talk about headaches and migraines yes it's common and you know how big of an impact that is affecting your day-to-day life people that we've worked with when they talk about headaches it literally takes them away from their job four days, they're maybe mm-hmm. laying in bed, they're hiding um, in the dark, especially with migraines, or there's always just this this feeling, this aura, or perhaps a sensation of like, okay, I feel something's coming up, and it's going to take them out for days. So there's that already that sense of anxiety that builds up with the headaches as well too, and migraines. And so this is such a necessary conversation because oftentimes headaches and migraines are also very much tied into so much that we find uh, right now commonly in people is anxiousness, anxiety, right? And even um, even just day-to-day stress. And so this is oftentimes tied into so, to so many other critical conditions or, or, or that affects our quality of health as well too. So yeah, so just for our listeners, just think about how much of an impact it has affected you when you've had, you have headaches and migraines. So I'm excited to be able to dig deeper into this and learn from Dr. Joe here. Yeah, definitely. And definitely, too, on that, with the, I think the most common thing I've heard a lot with people with this condition is they kind of socially, they almost feel like a flake because they can't heavily commit to anything. They don't know when it's gonna, their life's going to be disrupted by this, and they're you know constantly missing out on social events. So... Just so they have some groundwork for everybody to understand, Dr. Joe, what um, what is a headache and a migraine really? What's the difference between the two? Let's get some definitions first. Yeah, so a migraine is very different from a headache, mm-hmm. and I think most people who have migraine disorder would be very um, adamant about making sure that people understand that what, when they experience a migraine, it's totally different from a headache because it, migraines are, by definition, a neurological disease, and it's a progressive neurological disease, and usually is inherited genetically, so it runs in families, um, and usually more in, in females. And so a migraine typically, um, without getting too much into the, the diagnosis portion of this, mm-hmm. because it is very complex, the International Headache Classification Society criteria is very complex, but you know, let's just keep it simple. So for you to diagnose a migraine, basically, they're usually going to be unilateral. So the migraine is usually only going to be on one side of the head space. Um, typically, there are some migraine conditions that go between both sides, but primarily they're only on one side of the face. They are more uh, painful, so they're going to be more in a, of a pulsatile sensation. You know, your your head's going to feel like it's pounding. It's going to hurt a lot more then a, a headache is going to be um, accompanied sometimes by neurological changes before you have the actual migraine or the head pain event. That's called a prodrome. So you could experience different neurological symptoms like tiredness, fatigue, your stomach can kind of get upset, you got some visual changes. There's a long list of different symptoms that you could have before you actually get a migraine. You get some weird taste or smell that come about. You can get a little bit kind of dizzy. So those are the things that we look for when somebody's talking about their head pain, trying to figure out if it's a, a migraine or not. Now, the other side of that would be the headache. And the headache is definitely more common 
and easier to treat, and they can be on either side. A lot of times they'll bounce between back and forth, or they'll be like on frontal mostly, and the pain's going to be less. And you know, a lot of times people are going to be talking about some you know, pain in the back here and the neck. So that's kind of the big difference between the two. They're very different animals, although they both hurt the head. <laughs> yeah, most definitely. So I'm curious, neurologically speaking, and what's what's causing, or the best of your understanding, what's causing that migraine headache to be only on one side versus the headache to be bouncing between the two sides of the head? Well, a lot of your headaches, um, just to keep it simple again, are cervicogenic in nature. So, you know, most people having head pain roughly 60% are secondary type headaches, which means that the head pain is actually coming from, you know, something in the head, it's actually coming from something else. And most of those are uh, neck pain problems or neck problems that turn into headaches. And so that's a very different um, animal, if you will, because people are gonna have a lot of spasms in the neck, in the trap here, um, along the, the posterior aspect of the upper back here. And those spasms on you know, the right side can give more of like a right-sided tension type headache, which is the most common type of headache on, let's say, that right side. But then you can also have tension on the left side. And so you could have some here one day that is a little bit more stronger. And so you may feel it on this side. And so when you're talking about headaches a lot of times, they are so that are cervicogenic in nature. They're coming from structures in the neck, and so we can bounce between side to side. Now, if you have a migraine, that being a neurologic disorder, that's usually more related to a pathway in your nervous system that is not functioning appropriately, and so that's going to have a much more clear path of pain than, let's say, for a patient maybe it's always on the right side behind a, an eye or, you know, a temple, um, or, you know, kind of over here towards the ear area. And that's because the dysfunction is really uh, this very specific pathway in the brain, uh, usually actually in the, in the brain stem itself. So what exactly creates that dysfunction in that particular pathway? What are some major triggers, or why does that happen for migraines? So what we think right now is that migraine is a is a genetic hereditary neurological you know type disorder and so there these people actually have real problems with um, how their brain and their brain stem and all these neurological structures are functioning and so a lot of times what we're seeing in the research now and the the brain scans that they're doing is people have um, this sensitivity, if you will, in certain regions. And so you may have um, a patient that just can't really handle um, all the stimulation from different um, sensory systems. So if they can't handle um, too much uh, light, let's say, because that area in the brain, in the midbrain, is not functioning, they just can't handle that much stimulation. They can't handle too, you know, too much sound or they're having a lot of issues with um, their muscles being tight and their brain just can't handle that kind of stimulation from the muscles. And so primarily migraine is a disorder of um, too much um, sensitivity. They're just very sensitive neuro neurologically if these patients are. And we have to retrain the brain to basically um, be able to handle the sensory input. And we also have to eliminate triggers. So it's really a, a disorder that is different for everybody, depending on what part of the brain regions have dysfunction. But overall, it's a disorder that basically needs to be rehabbed gently so that they can handle their everyday lifestyle without getting too much overload from different sensory systems, if that makes sense to you guys. Yeah, absolutely. I'm also curious too, so oftentimes when people think about migraines, they also associate it or, um, you know, 
with 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 diet or with gut health as well too, because sometimes people who are struggling with some sort of autoimmune disorder, they may be struggling with migraine. Like one of the Prakash, like symptoms that may show up is migraines too. Um, do you see that in your office? And then how, you know, is that is an environmental factor a big trigger for for how that gets expressed with migraines neurologically? So if we're talking about just diet, let's say, you know, diet's one of the, the biggest ones. Um, there's a lot of different triggers, let's say, or a lot of different things that can need to be looked at in a migraine patient, yeah. and diet is definitely one of the biggest ones. And so we do that a lot of that in our office. And some, some of the bigger triggers, dietary, um, I want to give people something that's not really well thought about, and that's blood sugar regulation. So a lot of people have issues with blood sugar re regulation. So there, a lot of times that's a lifestyle thing like you talked about, um, when it's, you know, they're not maybe eating as regularly as they need to be. And so their blood sugar is fluctuating throughout the day, and they're going through these big peaks and these really low valleys. And that really stresses the brain out and create, can create um, an environment that have more migraine episodes. And so I would highly recommend anybody who has migraines to seriously look at, you know, keeping the blood sugar regulated throughout the day so it's as even filtered as possible. Uh, one of the things that we suggest people do is to keep a um, diet that's higher in healthier fats, and higher in proteins, and a little bit lower on our high glycemic index um, foods, you know, carbohydrates, and sugar so that we don't get these blood sugar spikes because a lot of times these days, you know, what I'm hearing from people as far as triggers, you know, that are just out there in the common um, environment everybody's talking about is like, oh, you need to stay away from, you know, your red lines or you need to stay away from your, your cheeses and you need to stay away from chocolate and, you know, these things. But, you know, a lot of people have tried that and maybe doesn't really make a big effect on them and still wondering what they can do for their diet. And a lot of times it's as, it's as simple, but um, it's simple as improving their blood sugar regulation, but that's not always something that's talked about. So that's, that's one of the bigger ones. Yeah, I've got a, a migraine diet that we give to people that is literally like four pages long. So, you know, it, the migraine diet, let's say, or the, the dietary triggers, the list is very long and it's very individualized like everything else and so you really kind of have to do a journal uh, with a patient or if you are a migraine sufferer and haven't done a journal you need to do a journal and kind of see maybe what stuff is triggering your migraine but definitely pay attention to blood sugar regulation that's the one that i don't still see anybody really talking about a lot so that's that's a big one yeah yeah i can imagine it would be huge um with that with that being said too are you pushing people more towards like a paleo or ketogenic type of diet then to help their blood sugar be more regulated? So for most people, you know, I wouldn't go necessarily too extreme with, with like a, let's say a ketogenic diet mm -hmm. because there's a lot of things in that ketogenic diet that could also trigger gotcha. a, a migraine. So I, especially like dairy and things like that, um, could definitely be a culprit because dairy is very inflammatory. Right. Uh, and that's one of the things that seems like a lot of you know, keto people get into, at least hardcore keto people. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily go that route per se. I'm more of a fan of just like well-rounded eating, you know, and eating more of a, a paleo. I would say it's more of a well-rounded, you know, eating style because you're going to mostly stay on your healthy fats, proteins, and, and, you know, and, and healthier carbohydrates. So yeah, I would think more of a paleo would be the best approach. Gotcha. Totally makes sense. Well, I think, you know, one of the biggest things is I, oftentimes when we see clients and they come in and they're like, I've had migraines for years and I've seen so many different practitioners. And I think, you know, why as practitioners, all three of us align is a sense that there is something behind the neurological approach. So when there's an imbalance or when there's that dysfunction in the brainstem, how does that start to happen early on for someone to suddenly develop migraines later on in years? Like what are some of the kind of developmental aspects that you think 
lays in, is kind of laid in there with the development aspect of the dysfunction after the pathways neurologically. That's a, that's a really good question. You know, I'm not really sure. I'm not sure if we really know how how people develop this per se. Mm -hmm. It's just something that certain people get usually, you know, genetically, and, and unfortunately, it's more um, more likely to affect females because mm -hmm. um, females are a little bit more complex. You know, you guys have all the the power of breathing life in this world, and so there's a lot more complexity there. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's not we're not really sure what you know why it is that people develop this disease, but there's definitely some, some dysfunction there that we that we find, you know, people with migraines are more likely to have certain brain regions um, actually be um, atrophied, so certain regions of the brain, especially the regions where they experience pain, so a lot of their somatosensory cortexes, like those regions in the face will actually be shrunk mm -hmm. because they experience so much pain, so that's something we see on um, fMRI and things like that will see very major um, structural changes not pathology per se but you know we'll see that you don't have as much um, much you know um, brain mass there and, and things but I you know I wish that we knew how these things were were developing more but you know it, it is interesting when you start treating people um, with therapies how quickly some of this stuff can change mm -hmm. absolutely what is it the term the concept like Things that wire together. Nerves that fire together, but wire together. Nerves yep. that fire, wire yep. together, fire yeah. together. Yes, and so h how crazy it is too, just the fact that you make a point that there's atrophy to the brain when there's dysfunction. Like We don't think about that. We don't think about how the actual mass of the brain is affected, especially in specific regions that are so crucial for so many other functions as well too. Big time. Yeah. Well, cool. Big time, yeah. Yeah, I mean, even um, in like low back, even in low back cases, I mean, you see structural changes in the brain. You know, people have low back pain, chronic low back pain. So, I mean, you can't yeah. have pain in your body and not have some change to the brain. The brain's the one creating the pain. Yep. Right. Yeah, I always think that's one of the most amazing things, too, in the world of neuroplasticity and that research right now is that how much the brain changes to these different stimuli. And, like, there's no, there's no waste up there. Like, if something's not being used, that real estate's going to get taken over by something else. And I think that's just... That's absolutely just really is amazing, and the adaptive capacity of the brain. And you know, this really ties in too with I'm curious because you talk about people with migraines, and we can even continue to lump people with headaches as well into this conversation. But you know, we see a lot of people that come in. Everybody's overstressed, right? Their sympathetic fight or flight nervous system is just wound up to the extreme. Is that the same case too with these people with? Headaches and migraines, are they more of that, you know, quote, sympathetic dominant state? Yeah, I would say that that's a very common cause. And I see a lot of migraines, migraineurs that I would say meet that criteria. So they come in your office, usually they're females. Mm -hmm. They usually tend to be more um, type A uh, females as well. So they're already you know, putting a lot of stress on themselves. So there's a lot of these patients um, are in a sympathetically driven state. Uh, their neurology is, is on fire, and that's one of the big things that we have to address in the lifestyle factors is that we have to help them to cope with their stress better because if we can't help them cope with their stress better, you know, we can adjust them, we can you know, change their diet, we can do neurological therapy, we can do vestibular therapy, you know, we can use laser, but at the end of the day, if we can't get the stress response down, then it's pretty hard to help um, these specific patients. And some of these patients, um, they're all, you know, under a lot of sympathetic stress um, or chronic stress because they have head, you know, head pain, a lot of head pain. Um, but, you know, some of these, it's really the, the stress that is driving the head pain more than other things. And so if that's one of the cases, then that's going to be one of the first things that we're going to have to address. And there's some really good studies out there that show that meditation is one of the best ways to manage migraine. Um, and that's long-term. Long-term migraine management um, is always improved. Um, from doing meditation the proper way because it helps people 
um, actually learn to um, interocept, like to get in touch with their body, and that um, interoception will basically turn on very positive brain regions and will start to rebuild these negative um, firing pathways that are winding people up and causing a lot of the migraine attacks. So that's something that is very common, and I know that you know you guys are really big on addressing this in your office. This is something that we do with our migraine population as well. Absolutely. I mean, I, I think that's the one huge epidemic that it's being talked about more, but still not being addressed, I think, appropriately. And it's such a garbage can line that we hear coming in. With people say, like, oh, I need to manage my stress better, but it's like, what does that really mean? How do you, how do, you do that? And no one really has an answer. Certainly not to bash the medical community, but they just don't really have a good answer for it. Um, how people can not manage their stress better, but as we talked about, adapt and have greater resilience to it. I think yeah, that's okay. critical. So it sounds like, you know, along with what we see in our practice too, it's just a lot of this time, a lot of times to lo manage long term migraines, it's really to really, you, you want to work with clients that are wanting to make proactive changes at home too, because it's not one of those where you can just do things in the office and just know that, okay, this is going to really help you. It's, it's, it's a commitment from both sides, isn't it? Oh, for sure. Yeah, I mean, we pretty much have to have a pretty stern talk about, you know, everything that's going to be done outside of office to improve your lifestyle because, you know, if you can't eat the diet that, you know, we need you to, to a degree, then it's going to be pretty hard to get over the migraine, you know, and if you can't, you know, learn to improve how you respond to stress, then we're going to have the same issues, you know. One of the things I've seen, you know, clinically too, um, is patients who have dizziness, you know, dizziness issues, vertigo issues, um, whether they have migraines or not, I've seen a lot of people um, with chronic stress come in and completely fail tests for um, dizziness and the severe problems. So there's definitely a real correlation between the high levels of stress and vestibular dysfunction or, or balance dysfunction. And that just kind of gives you an idea of how highly um, intertwined the stress system is with your overall neurological health because you know, somebody who's having an acute anxiety, you know, condition, let's say for, you know, a couple of weeks, something stressful will happen, like a family member die, and they can barely track with their eyes, you know, accurately, and they can barely balance. And that's all because of the extreme stress they're under. And it, and I agree with what um, Sam said. You know, people just think, you know, when we talk about managing stress, that it's such a just a, something we should just blow off, right? Oh, you can't, you know, this doesn't really matter. It's not really that big of a deal. And it, it is. Chronic long-term stress is a huge problem for people. I mean, we pick it up um, in blood pressures, you know, all the time. When people's blood pressure is erratic or it's, you know, really high, you know, um, chronically high. And a lot of that is because of the, the chronic stress that they're under. Big time. I want to talk about another trigger for these two, I mean, especially for headaches. So I feel like this is really the elephant in the room that obviously chiropractic has really, really been successful with, and that's the structural component of these things. So how much does just physical structure, especially of the spine and most likely the upper cervical spine that, and the cranial, bone, cranial bones have to do with causing headaches? Yeah, so for people who are having, let's say more of a headache um, type of disorder, you know, Structural care is really one of the best things that you can do. I actually was um, looking through some new guidelines that were put out, and it was talking about how um, you know the spinal manipulation, you know, chiropractic is a, a really good option for people who are suffering from cervicogenic um, headaches. I mean, even the um, international um, diagnostic criteria for um, our, our code sets that we do. So the new um, the new ICD-10 codes actually, they just released in the beginning in October, now in include a cervicogenic headache code. And so uh, there's definitely some um, understanding now that a lot of head headaches that people are having are you know, most likely coming from the neck, there's structural problems, and we need a structural solution for that. So instead of people 
you know, getting, you know, medications for these, you know, and having side effects and running up health care costs, one of the best things that can be done, and I think this was put in um, one of the, the guidelines, uh, I'm not sure who, whose guideline it was, if it was an AMA guideline or, or what, what, you know, organization came out with it, but basically they're saying that, you know, one of the best approaches is going to be chiropractic care, um, you know, and that structural component just can't, can't be treated any other way than with a structural solution. So I'm pretty happy that we're starting to head that direction because chiropractors have been really good results with headaches, you know, for for that de- yeah, for decades, for you know, 100 years, pretty much, you know, because it, it is such a great uh, therapy for a structural problem. It's when when the, when somebody goes to a chiropractor and they're they're maybe having a, a headache and it gets worse from structural care, that's when you got to start to wonder if they're having a, a migraine. That's something that's uh, pretty common with true migraine patients. Yeah, and definitely a big distinction. And we had talked about on a pre-chat is that that huge piece of like, look, if you're getting worse under chiropractic care, it's probably not a cervical joint headache. It's probably a true migraine. And then, yeah, you need to make sure you have a doctor that can dive deeper into some of these other triggers. And something you know, we had talked about as well that you know, just clinically that I've seen, I haven't seen any research or anything on this or any other imaging studies out there, but just the importance of cranial bone alignment with that upper cervical junction and how that's going to change the cerebral spinal fluid flow. So, I mean, just the simple fact that we have your sphenoid bone, which is a big wing-shaped bone right behind your eyeballs, and it connects to your occipital bone, which is basically the skull part that sits on top of your spine, how that's going to connect and create a pump for the cerebral spinal fluid that pumps it down through the spinal canal all the way down to your tailbone, which is then going to pump it back up. And if that's misaligned, whether it's those parts, whether it's the upper neck and or both, um, how that's going to change the, the fluid dynamics there and can increase pressure and can change vasculature, and which is going to alter neurology and everything else. So, I mean, just for people, like, that's a huge piece. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's actually a really good um, thing to talk about as well. I've actually really um, thought that just something really interesting that, um, came to mind. So I had a patient recently, female patient, who actually has a disorder um, w- where she gets too much cerebral spinal fluid buildup within her ventricles, yep. and it was giving her um, head pain, obviously, because she literally had too much pressure in her head from the spinal fluid, yeah. but also was giving her visual problems so that it was you know crushing in on her optic nerve. And so they actually had to go in there and put a shunt in there in her brain so that she can drain that fluid down into her stomach. And she um, had that procedure and uh, many years ago, probably like three, four years ago, and wound up in my office one day with some low back pain. And she's talking about, you know, uh, you know I've got this low back pain, no, but also I've got, um, I've got migraine, she says. And um, she has a neurologist, obviously, because she has this hydrocephalus and has the shunt. And, you know, I'm examining her and, you know, looking at you know, all the things we do in our office and, you know, feeling her neck. And it's like, man, your neck is just so tight. And I'm like, I bet you, you know, because your neck is so tight that even your shunt that you have that's in there that's draining the fluid from her brain is not really working effectively because the neck is so tight, right? So exactly what you're talking about, like her cerebral fluid dynamics were all because she has a serious problem, you know, with cerebral spinal function in her brain. But on top of that, she also has a tight neck and misalignment because of the tight neck. And that is causing her um, condition to be worse than it has to be. So what we did is, you know, just very gentle upper cervical type chiropractic with her. I actually used an instrument um, because we didn't want to, I think it was perfectly safe to adjust her manually just, just so we cover that topic. I've done it before. Mm-hmm. I've adjusted kids who have um, drains in their, um, in their neck, you know, coming from the brain to the stomach and, and had no issues whatsoever. But I used an instrument with her um, and did a lot of mild fascial work. And she was, um, I mean, at this point, she had no, no migraines, um, no headaches. Um, and she it had had those before the procedure to put the shunt in and after the procedure for the shunt and, uh, was continued to have head pain. And it just speaks to the power.
power just getting the structure of the body right. Man, you get that structure right, and some really profound physiological changes can take place. And that was the case with her. So you're right on about that. You can definitely have issues with you know just structural changes up here that need to be addressed and make a big impact on somebody's life. Big time. Yeah, and that's actually interesting. My grandmother had the exact same issue. She's like 91 now, lives in Houston. So I unfortunately can't take care of her, but. Yeah, same kind of thing. She developed hydrocephalus. She wasn't drained with cerebral spinal fluid. And we got to see her a couple months ago. And I mean, I'm looking at her neck and felt her neck just how tight it was. And I'm like, man, like, definitely there's some structural stuff here that I wish I could, you know, I could get her some help for because I know it would just give her some great relief. Definitely. Yeah, it's, it's huge. So I'm curious about some of these other, the other triggers that we had talked about, especially, um, you know, some, some things that aren't often addressed and looked at for these, but the, the hormonal piece and even the emotional piece, how that ties in. Yeah, so I'm going to go ahead and kind of cover like all the different um, pieces of this puzzle, if you will, yeah. and then we'll talk about the hormone and the emotional. So primarily when somebody has like a true migraine disorder, and just so be clear, you know, you can have headaches, right? You can have a headache problem, and you can have a, a migraine problem. And it does seem that there is like this sliding scale. Mm -hmm. So sometimes what we'll see is people are like on the headache side of things and sometimes they're on the migraine side of things. And so you can have both or you can slide between the two. And that's why you need a practitioner that can kind of treat both of them with different tools at different times. But primarily when somebody has a true migraine disorder, is then areas that need to be looked at are nutritional, which we've touched on a little bit, structural, which we've touched on. And hormonal, which we're getting ready to talk about, neurological, which is a neurological disease, and then that uh, that emotional component. And so, with the the hormones, you know, it being primarily a disease that affects females, you know, female hormones are something that need to be looked at when you have a a migraine patient, um, a female migraine patient, right? And so one of the things that we use um, in office and a lot of other practitioners that are similar, are similar to me um, that are using this uh, integrated approach to take care of migraine patients is a, a Dutch test. So we're you know, using a, a hormone test, it's a dried urine test for comprehensive um, hormones. And um, it's very simple, you know, we'll you know, have them take that test home, do the test sent to the lab, and get that back, and then we can see kind of what's wrong with the hormones, and then we can treat that in office with um, supplements and lifestyle modification, and or, you know, if it's somebody who I think is pretty advanced, then we have um, other practitioners in our area that we'll refer to, some, so we use them to an endocrinologist, somebody who's really um, good at female hormones, and a lot of times when they get that female, that female hormonal component under control, then um, that really can help the migraine disorder, especially if that was like the big one for them. Because when you look at all of those um, areas that I just mentioned, usually it's like one of them for somebody is a big one, right? So it's like you have like all these areas, and let's say like we evaluate them with a very thorough exam, and we're like, you know what, for this person, it's really neurological, maybe. Like maybe it's just that one. It's, that it's neurological because we. We did the exam and we know that they would say have some dizziness. They get dizzy every now and then or they get and then that dizziness is what it starts off their, their migraines and so maybe they have more of like a vestibular migraine. And so if we treat the vestibular system with some therapy and a lot of times if that was the big one that showed up on their exam, then they're gonna get like really good results really quickly. Um, but on the flip side of that, if it is a hormone and we don't do a good job with the hormones, then we're probably not going to do a good job for them because, you know, I can adjust that all day long and throw all these other therapies at it, but if it's primarily hormonal, it's got to be addressed. Absolutely. So that's a, that's a really important one. I'm glad you brought that up. And then the emotional component, you know, you can't separate emotion fr from the rest of, of the human body's health experience you know and that kind of goes back to the, the you know the stress component you know, I've had people that come in and you can just tell their life is in just a, they're just not in a good place right now in their life and under so much emotional turmoil and you know that's the big one for them right and so it's like if we can't stop all these emotional problems from the 
the things in their life that are causing the emotional problems, you know, then we're probably not going to be able to help them as much as we would like to. So for some of those, you know, I, if they're not willing to make the changes in their life, then a lot of times I'll be pretty straightforward with them, like, hey, you know, this is probably not a good place for you to be, you know, for treatment because, you know, we're just going to be wasting all your money and time so that you can make the changes in your life to get out of this situation, which is totally driving your, your emotional system into overdrive. Big time. Yeah, and that's it, it's funny how lifestyle and can be a kind of the, the biggest thing right in front of people that they just you know, you're you're in the forest so you lose sight of, you know, everything as you're just staring at trees all day, right? And you you forget like, oh man, this is really it's up to me to get out of this particular situation and as much as I want maybe a practitioner to be able to, you know, quote rescue me. Uh, it's really going to be up to me to do that. Yeah. Sometimes when we have clients in the office and I'm having a conversation, oftentimes the way I really help with um, or just start to help people connect, because oftentimes we think of the symptom that we're just trying to get rid of. And very much what you're talking about, Joe, is like you got to address these. You have to head. A, you have to face what you're challenged with and start to turn that around in your own personal home. And some of the conversations that I I love to have with with clients is really talking about, you know, what are some things that is just constantly in your mind that you're feeling so restless about that the headache has is like showing up there, and then what are some things that you're not able to allow yourself to get grounded about, and then oftentimes even just little com communication and looking at that is just like, oh, your symptom is just like a dial on the car where it's like paying attention to it so that you can start to make those changes and it's continually reminding people like our symptoms are there because it's it's reminders right there's something outside of, of that itself that needs to shift and how can you connect with your body differently and oftentimes the more we fixate too it's like this catch-22 like we want to be able to address the pain we address the migraine the diagnosis but at the same time the catch-22 behind that is if you fixate so much on it, becomes so much part of your identity that that becomes the thing that defines you, and that can tr like I can't do this. I tend to get migraines. I can't eat this. I can't. I tend to get migraines, right? Or I can't function this way because I, I get migraines. I I'd love to, but it's not. It's just not my thing. But when we talk about the emotional component, this is where this is my passion, my thing too. Yep. It's just that realization that you know it's like. It's like, can we allow ourselves to detach away from that identity of having a migraine because people have had it for so many years, unfortunately, and start to shift how life is possible without it and starting to have a conversation piece with clients from that perspective. And I think that that's also a very necessary component. And I think that's one thing that's so fun with being chiropractors is we can have that conversation. We have we make time for that conversation and have time for that as well too. Because oftentimes, unfortunately, with conventional medicine, people don't have time to talk about that. People don't have time to talk about their symptoms. They don't have time to talk about their challenges and what's going on and all related in that. Um, so I think that's really cool that you talk about that lifestyle piece and how important that is. So, yeah. <laughs> Definitely. So in our last couple of minutes, Joe, um, can we briefly touch on some of the things that you're doing in the office? We've talked around a lot of them, but what you're doing to get the excellent results that you're getting. Yeah, so you know, the big thing that you know I've learned, you know, treating a lot of head pain you know, over my career is that it's really important to get an accurate the diagnosis, if you will. And I don't mean necessarily like you know, where they are on the classification of migraine and, and a headache, but you gotta know what the problem is. Like, what's the dysfunction that they're having? And I kind of alluded to that earlier. So, you know, we do a detailed neurological exam on people, and so we're looking at, you know, their blood pressure bilaterally at the same time. You know, we're looking at, you know, how their eyes move with the right eye system. So we're actually using infrared cameras to kind of track the eyes, see if there's any problems with the ocular system that could be causing the, um, the migraine disorder. We're looking at their balance. We're putting on balance tracking system force plates, see if they have any balance problems. And when we get all these data pieces, then we can basically take a look at the person and decide, you know, like where is, or where are all the major dysfunctions? And then, 
we can create a strategy to say, you know, this this one area here, this is a big one, right? And like, if we have the tools to treat that area, then we'll we'll treat that area. And so, one of the the better ways, probably, to, to understand this for people is to kind of like talk through like a like a case, you know. And so, like, we'll, I'll give you an idea. Like, somebody comes to see me, and they've got um, you know migraines, and they've had them for a long period of time and you know we do an exam and you know immediately we see okay they don't have good balance right and so there's definitely some vestibular stuff there and so we're going to treat that with vestibular rehab and then we also see that they have just a lot of tension in their neck and so if we decided that stress isn't a big problem for them or stress isn't driving their migraine then we're going to do some chiropractic traditional manual adjusting if they can tolerate it, and usually people who don't have a stress problem can, or and there's a lot of lot of factors there, but usually they can handle that. You know, if somebody's really stressed out, you don't miss, you know, and their nervous system on fire, they may not really handle a service will adjust them really well. But if they can do it, we'll adjust them, and then we'll also do a lot of soft tissue work in the neck, and then we're going to also chat about the dietary stuff, and so we're going to we're going to have a conversation about that, and going to going to have them do a, a journal and, and see if there's anything that's popping up for them that we need to modify with the diet. And then, you know, when we're trying to build up these pathways, so let's say in this person, you know, with the migraines that they've been having for a long time, usually there are um, deficits in sensation on the face, you know, because the face is um, intervented by cranial nerve five and so it's giving you all your sensation here, you know, V1, V2, V3. And so we'll use um, the face as a therapy um, area. So we'll vibrate the face potentially or do some electrical stimulation on the face, laser the face, maybe run a pinwheel up and down the face. And that's all just to rebuild those pain pathways that have basically been altered from all the pain that they've had over the years. And so that's kind of just to give you an idea of the comprehensive and integrated approach that you know migraine patients really truly need to get the relief they're looking for because it's not usually just one thing. Um, and if it was, and if it is just one thing, one thing, then uh, uh, those are the easier ones, or they're the headache patients uh, I've found. You know, like if it's just structural, then that's probably a headache patient. Um, but you know, sometimes uh, it, you get lucky, but most of the time it is a lot. So for everybody out there listening, if you are a person that struggles with headaches and you have not considered chiropractic care, then definitely this is probably one of the first places you should really look for your relief. And if you're a migraine person, please take from this conversation today that there is hope. You just need to find the right doctor like Dr. Jill here who can look at all these different puzzle pieces, put that puzzle together to find out really what the trigger is. So Jill, uh, we're out of time now, but if how can people connect with you if there are listeners out there that are wanting to get some relief for something going on? How can they connect with you? Yeah, the easiest way to find me would be on Instagram. You know, we the business has a, a page at Calibration um, CFH, so it's Calibration Chiropractic and Functional Health. Um, you can also find me on my uh, practitioner page at um, Instagram as well at Renaissance Mind. And we're obviously on YouTube, and you know, we have a web page, obviously, and that's calibrationchiropractic.com. So we're pretty easy to find. We're always trying to put out new content to help people with conditions like this. And I'm happy to help anybody who is struggling. Just find somebody maybe close to them who um, who can help them with some of this stuff. Absolutely. We'll be sure if you are following us on our Facebook page with our Facebook Live for sure today to share. Um, Joe's information as well and and so we'll post that on there and wherever we have our show available we'll be sure to include all those resources for you as well too. Absolutely and mm -hmm. so if you enjoyed today's show please follow us on Facebook and Instagram at wildpreciousoptimalliving.com we host these shows again every two every other week mm -hmm. talking with great minds like Dr. Joe so Dr. Lynn close us out what do we like to leave everybody with? Tell me what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? We'll see you in two Fridays.